Welcome to the Be Better broadcast where we come at you with tips and strategies and techniques to help you to bring your business to the next level, whether you're in sales or you operate some other kind of business. But the reality is all of us are in sales and we talk about sales a lot on this show. We talk about sales a lot with our experts who come on because I believe that we're all in sales. We're all selling every single day. And one of the most common facets of sales that a lot of us try avoiding, a lot of us feel like we don't want this specific thing, is rejection, right? We've all been rejected at some point in our life, whether it's rejected by our family, rejected by our parents, we're, we tell them we want something, we were told no. And from a very early age, we've been programmed in this way to not want this feeling of rejection. Leading into elementary school, middle school, high school, we go after the crush that we've been seeking for all those years. And they look at us and they're like, no, man, I'm good right? And it crushes us. It destroys our spirit. And then we go into the sales world, right? So now we're selling a product or a service or ourself if we're a personal brand, which we all are. And then some people reject us there too. And we can take it personally. We can shut down. But I think the greatest fallacy of all is when we aren't rejected at all. Because when we're not rejected at all, then we have no opportunity to sell because we didn't go for the no. And I'm so excited to talk to our expert today for many reasons. One, because she's in the world of sales for many, many years, but also because I was heavily inspired by this expert's book called Go For No. She's the co-author of Go For No. Her name is Andrea Waltz, and I'm going to introduce her in a second, but this book was so instrumental in my growth as a salesperson in my early 20s, especially when I started to train salespeople where I had to help them overcome this idea of rejection. So without further ado, for those who aren't familiar with Andrea Waltz, and if you're in the sales world, I'm sure you are familiar. Andrea is the co-founder of Courage Crafters Incorporated, and she's the co-author of the best-selling book, Go For No, and Yes is the Destination, and No is How You Get There. For almost two decades, Andrea has been teaching people in virtually every business and industry how to think and feel differently about failure, rejection, and the word no to achieve their goals and dreams. Andrea is a member of one of the highest regarded professional groups of women in sales called the Women Sales Pros, and she is considered a top sales influencer online and is featured on lists curated by HubSpot, Salesforce.com, LiveHive, and many others. The book, Go For No, reached number one on Amazon's sales and selling list in 2010. And guys, check this out. It has remained in the top 50 of sales books for the last 11 years. Really, go check out the book right now. It has like 3,000 four and a half, five-star reviews. It is absolutely incredible. So Andrea, it's a pleasure to to have a sales celebrity here with us today. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. It is great to be with you. And I, I loved your introduction because you really like framed the issue so perfectly. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. And I train new salespeople for many, many years. And it's one of those things that they were so afraid of even offering something because they were afraid of hearing no, right? And it's it's like this epidemic in itself. And th this is the thing about failure that's so interesting, Andrea, at least from my own experience. Even today, like even now, although while I know these principles and I, I understand them intellectually and have put them into practice for a few years, the people who I'm most afraid to offer something to are generally the people who say yes. It's the people who I thought were going to say no are the ones who go for it. And I always think afterwards, what if I didn't mention it, right? What if I had gone with that voice inside my head and didn't pull the trigger and didn't offer the product? So my question to you is, why do we have this innate fear of rejection? Why do we fear this word no? Yeah, well, um, and you explained the kind of progression of it. It starts in our DNA. We're hardwired to not be rejected. It's, it's built into us um, as humans. I mean, you know, we're we're wandering the planet fundamentally in small groups for thousands of years. You did not want to get thrown out of the tribe. You did not want to do something stupid and have everyone go like, okay, Bob is just not cutting it. He's going to he's on his own. He can hunt, he can gather on his own, get him out. Right. And so, um, 
that's where we come from. So here we are in like this society in modern day times, but we still have that old wiring and that old programming. And I like to say that even if you, uh, I mean, you can totally work on your mindset with this issue and you can make huge progress, but the I guess you'd call it the sting of rejection. There's actually been research done about the physical, like that rejection equates to physical pain. So if you ex have ever experienced that literal sting of rejection or like that that gut reaction in your stomach, wherever it, you you feel it for yourself and you're in your body, that is is a feeling that's really hard to make go away. So the key is how can we kind of um, again, hack our mindset and then just learn to live with that feeling. Hack our mindset and then learn to live with this feeling. That's very, that's fascinating. I, you know, later on, I'm going to ask you like what we can do in order to overcome that sting and how we can hack our mindset. But my first question is there's so many different facets of sales that you could have focused on prospecting, building the relationship, follow up, closing the sale, whatever. There's many different avenues, but you've written several books now on specifically rejection and the fear of failure. So why did you pinpoint this one area? First, how did you discover the need? And then how did you make the big decision to publish a book on this one topic of sales in itself? Yeah. So um, my co-author, my business partner, my husband, Richard Fenton, um, he one day, we, we were actually working in uh, Lens Crafters together. We, he was um, a trainer. He, he was one of the, one of the uh, sale training directors for the company. And I was starting to get into training as well um, in terms of like sales training and customer service and that, that type of stuff. And so we were kind of comparing notes and I would kind of challenge him and ask him questions because he always seemed like he knew everything, right? <laughs> and kind of irritated me. Um, and one day he told me this go for no story that happened to him when he was selling suits for a living mm -hmm. and he was uh, failing and the district manager, a, a guy named Harold was going to visit the store. So Richard tells me the story about how Harold shows up and he, Richard ended up, um, getting this sale that happened in front of Harold. A customer came in, said he wanted to buy an entire wardrobe of clothing. Richard proceeded to have this great sale. He, he shows this guy all this clothing. The guy like buys everything that Richard lays in front of him. <laughs> He's got this great sale. It's like $1,100. And of course this goes back you know, many, many years now. So like today it would be, I don't know, $5,000, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. in, in equivalent. So he has this great sale. And then finally Harold, asks him this question about the sale. And he says, you know, out of curiosity, Richard, what did that customer say no to? And Rich is like, what do you, what do you mean? What did he say no to? He bought everything I laid in front of him. And then Harold asked him the really important question, which was then how did you know he was done? And that was the kind of the life changing question. Richard was like, oh, how did I know he was done? He was done. Cause I basically said he was done. Richard basically was like, Hey, you hit a thousand dollars. Let me just walk you up to the register. Let's send you on your way. And um, we don't actually put this in the book, but when we tell this story live, uh, Rich always adds the line that Harold said, um, do you know where that customer is right now? And Rich is like, no, where? And he goes, he's at the other end of the mall, spending the rest of the money that you didn't let him spend with us. So it's kind of this, this lesson. And so he tells me this story and I actually thought I was a superstar salesperson. I, I, customers loved me. I, I built relationships. I, my sales were always good. I, they weren't stellar, but they were good. And then I had to get honest and I was like, wow, you know what? I don't hear no very often. I don't, I don't like to hear no. And then I, so I had this epiphany and, um, I just became kind of like obsessed with it. Like I applied it on the job. I, I did go for no, and I saw these amazing results. And then one day, Rich comes to me and he's like, hey, listen, um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you know, you're a great trainer. Um, he was an amazing, he's an amazing gifted speaker. And he said, I think we should quit our jobs here. And I think we should launch a company doing you know, speaking and training and go for no is one of the things that we would teach. And I was just young enough and naive enough. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in, let's, let's do it. I had no idea what I was doing. I'm cold calling 
you know, like Fortune 500 retail companies, which was our target, uh, trying to get booked as trainers, as speakers for their events. And that's mm -hmm. basically where it all started. And then eventually we decided to write Go For No, um, the book, really as a as a door opener to selling training, basically. That is an incredible story. And I've heard that suit store story. <laughs> like it, it's traveled the world. Like it's it's <laughs> everywhere. Cause we had a sales trainer come in who actually used that story, but he didn't credit where he heard it from because I don't think he remembered. Right. And I started using the suit store story, and you told it much more eloquently than I did. But it's just so amazing to finally you know, you've done the 180 and now you've finally found where that story comes from. And it's very like serendipitous that I have the opportunity to even have that conversation with you, which is so cool. When you were now cold calling on these fortune 500 companies, right? Like when you think of that in your mind, like from, you know, an outside point of view, it's like, that's a big task. Like fortune 500, they're earning millions in revenue. You want to sell them something when you probably had to put these principles to the test during that point of your life. So when it came to you reaching out to these companies, how were you applying these principles of go for no during that sales process? That's a great question. And, um, you know what, Brianna, I was perfect. Like I had no issues. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a train wreck. I'm telling you it was, um, it was ugly. I was terrified. I mean, I, put go for no to the test. But as Richard likes to point out, he always says, you know, we never could have written the book or neither one of us could talk about this as an issue. If we are, if we were one of the 1% who are like, we have no problem with the word, no fear, rejection. What are you talking about? You know, get, just get over it. Like just, it's just try to forget it. Like that is our big pet peeve of let's, let's not pretend this doesn't exist. Let's actually instead go the opposite direction. So yeah, I remember sitting in our home office going like, all right, get I get to make a fool out of myself again today by calling a company and trying to act like I'm an I'm actual business person and I know what I'm doing. And so yeah, I would call and be like, um, who is in charge of your training department? And half the time I would get a name, the other half would be like, uh, you, yeah, who, who's the name that you have? And I'd be like, well, I, t I actually don't have a name. And, and sometimes I would resort to some of the, the crazy, you know, tricks. I'd be like, well, is it, is it Tina Johnson? Is she still there? And um, no, that's Tina Johnson. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's Kathy. It's Kathy. Oh yeah, trick. Kathy. Yeah. I no, no, I knew that. I knew it was Kathy. So could you put me through to Kathy? Um, I mean, whatever it took to figure out who the, who our prospects were. So, but I was scared all the time and just pushed through it. Um, we set, eventually we started setting no goals. Um, like we teach in the book where we teach people to set a certain number, try to get a certain number of no's. But um, yeah, I can't say that it was pretty. No goals. I love that idea of of going. I mean, that's the name of the book of going for no and having a goal to actually hear no. We did something quite similar when we did outreach to even like we didn't really do a lot of cold outreach. All the outreach we did in the cellular industry was we reached out to people who purchased from our store locations in the past. And even with that warm traffic, we still got that feeling of, oh, my God, like, what if they don't want to talk to us? What if what if, you know, they, they hang up on us? What if they yell at us? What if they don't want what we have? And I used to say, like, you should really make it an effort to put a yes column, put a voicemail column, put a no column for every no you get make a check and you want to have as many of those as possible because that means that you put in the most amount of effort. It, it was always strange for me because one of my, I, I was always a top salesperson, like the top salesperson, but even I wasn't even touching my potential because I would be like, like Richard in the suit store. I would be talking to the customer and I would have sold them a lot of things already. They came into like pay a cell phone bill and they were leaving with two new phones. They were leaving with all the accessories for them. They got insurance on it. They got the setup, all these things. And I would just, I would start to sell with my own wallet and I would start to think, well, you know, I shouldn't mention the iPad to them 
because they've already bought so much. I don't want to over, I don't want to overdo my welcome here and, and offer too much of them. And that's when that voice got into my head of this is already enough. I'm happy where it is rather than think about the customer. So how would you advise someone like myself who is already performing very well in sales, like many of the people listening to take it to that next level and to go past that inner voice that tells me to stop mentioning more? Yeah, that's a really good point because I think a lot of people find themselves in that category. I, I feel like I was there too, right? I mean, I was, I was, I, I waffled between good and great. I always joke that I was a superstar, but I mean, like you, I kind of didn't want to push my luck and I, I didn't want to look, I think the, the issue is I didn't want to look like one of those pushy, aggressive, uh, overly domineering salespeople. So you always kind of hang back. And it's one of these things where it's just a practice that you have to put into place um, moment by moment. That's why one of the things that we teach people is to look at your, um, your process, your sales process, and identify all of the go for no moments that you could potentially have. And so when I say go for no moment, I mean, like in your case, you had a lot of go for no moments, right? You're selling, um, you're selling the first phone, the second, the third, maybe the third line. And now you've got accessories and now you have the iPad and, and yeah. you have all these things. So you have all these opportunities to ask. So when we identify our go for no moments, then the next, that's, that's one piece. And then the next piece is what's your overall goal. And for me, I always like in my head, I wanted to be liked and as salespeople, we all want people to like us. And that's where we get into trouble, right? So it's how do I make people like this process and like me while also getting results and making sure that I show them everything? So it's always linking your the purpose, your um, desire to make somebody enjoy this process with what you're going to what with what you're selling. So how do you do that? And the the way that you really do that is to always remember that your that to sell is to serve. You are serving them. And by not recommending the iPad, what you're doing is really a disservice because now they're going to go home and in three months be like, wow, I wish I, uh, I, I had an iPad. And maybe they could have gotten a deal. Maybe they could have gotten, you know, $20. Off. So, um, in that go for no moment is where you just have to practice having the courage to ask. And when you link it to serving people, then by what you say, then it doesn't come across salesy. So my example would be, hey, listen, I, I know you're getting a lot here, um, probably a lot more than you anticipated since you just walked in the door to pay your bill. But I would be remiss and I wouldn't feel good if I didn't just mention this one thing. You don't, it, there's no pressure, don't do it today. But I just wanted to mention that we also have and just call out the elephant in the room at every turn. Just be as transparent and honest as possible, saying, like, I know this is a lot. I know you didn't plan on this, but. I'm, I want to mention this to you because if I just let you leave and I don't, then I'm doing you a disservice. And I think that's the, I think that's the best strategy to do that. And you have to have, you have to have some self-awareness. You have to recognize that um, sometimes enough is enough and you might shut it down, I guess, a little early if you just think the person is running late, they don't have time, in which case it's like your um, awareness of the situation and your desire to sell has to kind of come behind other situations. So <laughs> I guess to finally, finally put a bow on this and wrap this thing up, it is more art than science. There are some strategies and things, but with every customer, it's always going to be a little different. Yeah, I love how you related it to service too and going at it from the mindset of first, if I don't offer this to them, they might get home and they might see a friend that had gotten the iPad or whatever the product is. And they're thinking now, well, why didn't Brandon mention that to me? Like it, we're doing them. It's actually kind of in a way I used to tell my, my new salespeople in a way it's very, it's unethical not to mention those things. Because what if I mentioned it at the desk next door and they heard that and they're like, well, why is he mentioning that? the iPad and you didn't mention it to me. And I love the line of, and I used to use this actually all the time. 
hey, listen, I know you, you came in to pay a bill and you're leaving with a lot more than you expected to leave with right now. I completely get that. But don't hate me if I tell you there's one more thing I have to show you because I think it's going to make a lot of sense for what you're looking to do. And I always even said, you know, I, listen, I don't even know if this is going to be for you, but it would be a disservice if I didn't tell you about it. And now the curiosity gears are turning in their mind and they're like, well, how does he know if it's not for me? What is this? Show it to me. Let me decide if this is for me. And it's astounding as long as the product is actually right for them. You can't just throw everything at the wall. It has to be right. It has to come from a place of service. It's astounding the amount of people who actually took that product after you framed it in that way. I think, like you said, it's all about framing. You can't just go at it like, hey, are you sure you don't want this? I have to hear you say no. Like You can't go at it from that way. You have to frame it in a logical way that you really will only discover through experience. And I like how you said sometimes enough is enough. And I know you gave a couple examples. Is there a time that you teach where you don't go for no. Like, what are some examples or times where you would just say, okay, this is enough. I'm not going to continue. What does that look like? Yeah. Um, again, I think it comes back to education and you have to, meaning education of, of uh, the customer. And so, but you do have to read the situation and you have to read people. So it's having that empathy. And I think um, there were absolutely times where someone would come in and we've all been there. Like they come in and they're on a mission and they say, I want this. I want only this. And then I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and in that moment, certainly you have you have options and you have things that you want to show and you want to sell. And you just have this intuition of this is just for whatever reason, not the right time. I can just tell. And so, again, uh, can you educate? Can you slip it in and say, I can just and, and it I call out the elephant in the room. I can tell you're on a mission today. I can tell you don't want to waste a lot of time. So, yeah, let me. Let me help you out with this. Um, we've got a couple specials going on. I, 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 you probably aren't interested, so I'm not even going to run you through them because I know that you're in a hurry. And then in that moment, if they go, well, I'm not like in that hurry. What, what are you talking about? Mm. And so you open the door a little bit. You have that. You have that option. It just, but I, again, that intuition in sales, it can't be taught, as you've said, you, it does have to, you have to gain that experience. But for a lot of people, and this is the trick, they don't want to go through the pain of getting that experience. They'd rather just like, I want to just shut up about all of it and not have to deal with anything. I don't want the awkwardness. I don't want somebody to turn around and yell at me and go like, Hey, I told you if I wanted this, I would have asked. We've all had those, then they're horrible, right? They're, they're like, you get slapped down and that's the interaction you remember. That, that gets imprinted in your brain early on. And so you could have a thousand interactions that go smoothly and people love you and they think you're the greatest, but it's that one negative slap down that you remember. But we have to remember that that was one or two that happened out of hundreds. Yes. And I, it's, it's important that you go through the pain of feeling that, and you can really only go through that pain by going for no. So in a way you're, you're already doing it. And once you feel that you just, you don't become numb to it, but I, I found that the feeling of rejection changes once you go through enough of it. And for me, it became like a game of being rejected. Like it became actually now when I mentioned something, I was just very happy that I went for no. Like I was just happy that I actually went for it. So when I mentioned something and they thought about it, which made me feel even better because like if I didn't mention it, they wouldn't have even had an opportunity to think about it. But when they do look at me and they say, hey, you know, thanks for mentioning that, but we're good right now. I get like almost like a hit of dopamine when they say no. It's like, okay, well, hey, thanks for hearing me out. I appreciate you hearing me out. If anything changes with that, just let me know in the future because situations will always be different in the future. But it became a game of going for no. And once you got there, you can say, okay, like I, I got a token, right? I made progress. I'm leveling up over time. So my question to you is like through your experience of writing this book 
And I'm sure you hit a lot of no's even in the writing of this book with publishing and everything else that came in in, in the way there, the obstacles you overcame with you reaching out to Fortune 500 companies with everything you do today. Like, How has your experience of rejection changed over the years for you personally? What a great question. Fun question. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and very much like you, it we use the phrase numb yourself to know. And once you experience that rejection over and over, it, it doesn't bother you. It's kind of like, um, it's like anything that you attempt enough, the failures just kind of roll off of you easier. Whereas initially when you start selling and you get a no or somebody, um, you know, is harsh to you. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, you, you're taken aback. You can't believe it. And then um, you do it long enough and it just becomes kind of second nature. So my mindset has shifted greatly because I was this people pleaser, wanted people to like me. And the biggest change that I have had personally, and I, I just worked on this mostly by reading books on mindset and psychology. One of my favorite books is called The Four Agreements, oh, is yeah. how, right? Is how to take, how to not take no personally, how to pull yourself uh, out of the process. And for me, it's been, it's almost like I put myself in the other person's shoes and look at it from their perception and say, so if they uh, some people hate go for no. Like some people think it's the stupidest thing. Like go for no. Why would I want to go for no? I want yes. This is ridiculous. Wow. These people are these people are lunatics. And I go like, okay. It's very ignorant though. It is, and and some and you'd like to, people to be open minded, but it, that's that's okay. The reason they're having that reaction, I think, is kind of twofold. Is um, they they're ma just making assumptions like mm -hmm. oh it's this it's that and we all we all do that but this is their belief their programming their background everything and i try to say andrea you have things in your life that you rebel against that you see and you go like oh that's stupid and and i hate that tv show and you know like things and i don't know anything about that tv show I, but i but i hate it <laughs> so so I put myself in other people's shoes and I go, that's just how it is. Maybe at some point they'll be open-minded, but when we remember that, I think it takes the sting out of it and it becomes all about the other person. So when it comes to taking no personally, my, my mantra is it's not about me, even when it's about me, because it's always about the other person and what's going on with them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when you're talking to these busy professionals, especially when you were reaching those decision makers of those large companies, and a lot of people listening can relate to those people are, they're just busy. Like they have a lot going on. They don't want to skirt around what you want them to do. They want you to say, they, they want you to ask them for the sale because then they can make a decision. Does it make sense based on the information provided or does it not make sense? So going for no really is more of a service to them than it is for you. And it makes it easier for you. Like, don't like, I have so many, like just in this world, coaches reaching out to me constantly and they're like, you know, Hey, how's this going for you? How's this going? And they just keep asking question, question. And it's like, just tell me about what you do and ask me for the sale because I'm too busy to keep going back and forth, back and forth. And it's the same thing with people. Like don't skirt around the issue, be direct right after you've given them enough information to make a decision. Now for the person listening, who's like, this is all well and good. Like I can make my, my no goals. I can work to numb myself to it. I can go through experience, but Andrea, I want results now, but I have this fear of rejection. What would you say is one tip that could make one of the most drastic differences for people if they began applying it today? So again, this is, this is a mindset thing and it is to me, all about embracing the principle of go for no. This is like the underlying principle. And in the book, we start off talking about failure. And the reason we do that is because underlying all of this is a desire to not fail, right? We talked about like rejection is, is in our DNA. Simultaneously to that, we all want to be successes. We want to get to yes. We don't want to fail. 
And it all comes down to giving yourself permission to fail. I had to do that when calling on these companies. Like I told you, it was like, okay, let's fall on our face again today. I can't tell you how many times I was, my voice was shaking. I was nervous. I was trying to make this smooth presentation and it came, I, you know, butchered it, um, literally just trying to ask for somebody's contact information. So you have to give yourself permission to fail and permission to mess up. But instead what we do is it's like, well, no, I have to be perfect. So I have to either wait and somehow magically craft um, a perfect presentation and a personality that's not phased by, you know, rejection, which is never, or mm. um, I'm just never going to take action. It's just always going to be something that's in the future. So as weird as that sounds and you're like well how do you give yourself permission to fail it's it's then instead of saying okay i'm going to make this call or i'm going to do this thing or send this person this message and i've got to succeed it's i'm going to be totally 100 percent okay with a no i'm going to be okay if i sound like an idiot i'm going to be okay if they hang up on me the goal is simply to do the behavior i'm mm -hmm. not focused on the result i don't care what it is literally you completely detach and you say, I'm going to simply focus on the behavior and then even, so allow yourself to fail. And then when you do the behavior, reward yourself for that behavior. Wow. So when you make the call, no matter what the result is, you have to reward yourself. This whole thing is almost like, it's like retraining um, yourself. Like if you were five years old, you know, your parents like, Hey, I want you to do this thing. And if you do, if you go to the doctor and you know, you're good and you, you get your measles shot, then we'll take you for some ice cream. And you go like, okay, I, it's worth the trade. Um, that's what we're doing here. What are some healthy ways in which you'd recommend people reward themselves? Yeah. I like that you said healthy because for me, it's <laughs> always about like snacks yes. and food, especially in sales. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes if for me, it's like, we all love distractions. So I try to say, okay, I need to make three reach outs here. And until I do them, I, I don't get to mess around on Instagram, or mm -hmm. I'm not going on Facebook or whatever. So that that's one thing where it's like putting some barriers in place. But to the extent that you can have some, you know, set something aside, that's not too bad for you. Um, if the reward is easy and if it's like quick and something that you uh, can give yourself, you know, relatively easy, not too off in the distant future. That said, Brandon, even like the verbal kind of pat on the back, you know, the like, hmm. okay, I did it. That was awesome. I'm awesome. Really goes a long way because most of the time in sales, we're really hard on ourselves. We're so good at beating ourselves up. We're so good at getting off the phone going like, oh my gosh, could you have sounded any more awkward and lame, right? That Those are the things <laughs> that we think instead of like, okay, I did it. I, I did it. It was, it went fine. I didn't die. Um, that kind of self-support because there's no one else out there and, and you can have a sale, great sales manager, but they're not with you 24 seven. They're not with you every hour, like patting you on the back and cheering you on. So you've got to be your own cheerleader, you almost have to reparent yourself and be this, be your own supporter. You have, you have to. You really do. And I think that that's why, you know, those who are massively successful in sales are self-starters, they're self-driven and they create their own business inside of the business, unless it is their business. And I love that tip of even just the verbal celebration to yourself. I think that that's that is self-motivation. I think you could use that in sales. You could use that when it comes to going to the gym, right? You hear that voice and you reward yourself by going there by saying great things to yourself. And that just builds you up and boosts you up and it gives you that dopamine hit and it makes you want to do it over and over and over again. Wow. Really awesome tips in the time that we've spent here. So everyone, we're talking about the book called Go for No. You can find it on Amazon. Literally, you could probably just go to the sales category and it just pops up, guys. It's been top 50 for the last 10 years, which is incredible. And you got to read it. You got to go through the book. It, is it also an audio book as well, Andrea? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, is, which is crazy because this goes back like in 2000 and 
I think it was like 2003. Yeah, we were living in Los Angeles and we were, this is of course like decades before Audible even came on the scene. And we decided we'd record it as an audio. So we, we went to a studio and Richard um, recorded it. He's he's the main voice. And I do like every, I do like the chapter headings or whatever. Cool. But we recorded in this cool studio in Los Angeles that was for musicians. And I'm so glad we did because uh, as luck would have it, Audible comes around early on and they're desperate for content, right? Mm. And we happen to have this audio that we had made years earlier. And I'm like, I have this now. So we were very lucky. We were one of the first audio books out there. So the book has done really well on Audible. That's incredible. So for those who aren't really the paperback reader, go on Audible, listen to the book, one of the first books on Audible. Now, for those who want to go even deeper into this, you've mentioned your course. Can you tell me a little bit about your course and what people can expect with that? Yeah. So like everything we create, we really try to keep the fluff out of it. And you mentioned at one point, you said, you know, you didn't go into uh, a bunch of areas in sales, like you didn't go into closing and you didn't go into this and that. And that's really true. Um, we wanted to be focused on this one topic hmm. because even our discussion has been kind of all over the board. And there's still things that you and I haven't even talked about. There's still like roads that we could still go down. So the course really gave us an opportunity to dig into some of that, um, both mindset and also strategy. But at the same time, I, I can't stand these bloated, you know, like 25 hour long courses and you get this bonus and that bonus. And you pretty much go like, so fundamentally, it's going to take me my entire life to finish your material <laughs> is what you're telling me. Yes. Um, I, I don't want that for somebody. I want, I want somebody to be able to get the best of the best, what we believe are the core issues. So we um, crafted this program many years ago and it was on CD and then we just literally got it uh, online. It's Richard and I taking people through some, some strategy, some mindset issues. And then uh, the best part of it for me is that we have a private Facebook coaching group that is tied into the course. So you go through the course, um, which you, it's about three hours. So, I mean, I, I tell people go through it multiple times, like go through it once a quarter and then hang out in the group for that motivation because, um, Notivation. Is Notivation. That, what you just said? that is what I said. Yeah. I love that word. Notivation. <laughs> yeah. There's motivation. You need motivation because we all know that it fades, right? It's you hear any motivational speaker, not that we are, but you hear these messages and you're like, oh, it's so good. It makes sense. And then you just tend to forget. So mm -hmm. I feel like this is a, this is one of those mindsets that you just need that repetition to keep the practice alive. It's like anything. It's like stretching, right? You, if, if you don't stretch for a while, you go back to it. You all of a sudden you're like, I've lost all my flexibility. This is ridiculous. It's the same thing with our mind. Absolutely. And if we can find Go For No on Amazon, where can we find your Go For No course? Uh, GoForNo.com. GoForNo.com. Yep. Easy enough. Very cool. Easy enough. So everyone listening, you can find the Amazon link in the description. You can find GoForNo.com in the description. Go check it out. It's a timeless classic that will up your sales performance immediately after reading and then just once you begin to scrape the surface of using the material, it's going to make a giant difference for you. Andrea, my final question for you is what is the positive impact that you want to make on the world at this chapter in your business and life? Mm. Well, Brandon, I'm so, I just love this message and I love it because um, two things. One, I definitely have, have gotten, Richard and I have gotten great feedback over the years of, like results oriented, you know, numbers, people going like, I, I won the incentive trip to Mexico. I, I got this, I got that. Um, but then I hear from people who are just like, I've, I've had some crazy stories, people in India who are reading the book with like their 82 year old mother and they're having these <laughs> epiphanies and it's like, wow, that's so, that's so wild. And people from every walk of life. So I just love that really to me it reframes the the reframing of failure and success that underlying principle that if you want more success in your life you've got to be willing to embrace failure 
I think that is for every profession. I think it's for all of us. And that's the message that is most important to me is, is just letting people fail more so that they can be willing to try and, and have some interesting things happen in their life. So I love that message. That's an amazing impact you're making and have made over the years. And I thank you very much for your time and for sharing your tips and wisdom. Thank you, Andrea. Absolutely. My pleasure. When I saw that I was going to have the opportunity to have this discussion with Andrea, me starting in sales when I was 18, being 27 now, only ever working in a career of sales, I totally nerded out when I had the opportunity. And I hope that you all found the same amount of value that I was able to take out of this conversation. And when it comes to going for no, like Andrea mentioned many times, it's really all about the way that you're framing it in your mind and your mindset around hearing the word no and being rejected. And there's many strategies you can use with this, such as having a no goal and you know rewarding yourself after putting in the activity. And there's many things that you can do that you might not be doing right now that can make a drastic difference in your own performance while also delivering a drastic improvement of service to the individuals that you're working with. And all of this comes down to, like Andrea mentioned, tying these principles together with the ideas of serving other people to make a difference in their life. Because sales isn't about making money. Sales isn't about just building a business. Sales is about taking your product or service and using it to make a difference in the lives of other people. If you found value in this discussion with Andrea, share this show with one person who could use these tips with one person who's in sales, but only if you found value from this show. Again, links are in the description to go grab the Go For No book in Amazon and also grab and go through and digest the Go For No course which includes the the exclusive Facebook group too, where you can be held by the hand to go through these situations in your own life, in your own business. Links are in the description. Thank you all so much for watching. And until we talk again next time, continue to be better.